Well, Merry Christmas. It's great to see you today. As Rodney was noting earlier, I, I just love everything about Christmas here at our church. And one of the beautiful things of being uh, your pastor, some of us get a chance to do this, but I get to see the entire church family. Uh, Rodney was noting from the littlest ones to the eldest ones among us, it has been a glorious Christmas season. Some of you here for the first time this Christmas season, but there's nothing like Christmas at Park Cities, and I love everything about it. I love the lights, I love the music, the choir and the orchestra, everything about it. I was with, um, yeah, so many of us last week, um, with all the highs and lows of Christmas, we were at the celebration of remembrance and just grieving together, and I was reminded again of how powerful the church is together, uh, grieving uh, the loss of those who are not with us. You know, memories of Christmas's past remind us of who's not present in, in the now. And that can be a really hard time. And so with all the celebration, um, I know many of us are sad today. And we're going to acknowledge that. We're going to talk about that a little bit. But uh, I love being with our, our senior adults. It was last Friday, as Rodney mentioned, uh, the event on the lawn, Majesty, was amazing. Stacy and I went to, I think, our last Christmas party last night, got home late, partying with a group of uh, one of our connect groups. So it's just been a beautiful thing. I love it all. Um, but I, I just want to tell you that it's okay not to love everything that we've made Christmas out to be. Like if I hear Santa baby one more time, <laughs> um, is there a more cringy song than that one? Um, someone in the early hour came up afterward and said, yeah, baby, it's cold outside. That would be, that one is out there as well. But um, I, I say all that because with all the highs and lows, you know, with the joy of the season, and there's, that's the, that, that'll be the message today. There's cause for great joy. There's no question. But it's also appropriate to acknowledge that this can be a really sad season. So with all the highs and lows, I think most of us are somewhere in the broader middle. And, and so I want to I wanna say this, um, and this probably is a message that could have come, or this word could have come early on in the Christmas season. And that is that it's possible for Christmas to feel a little forced. It's possible for Christmas to feel a bit contrived, maybe. Uh, or maybe you're like me. Maybe Christmas came on, at the wrong time on the calendar for me this year. Uh, it was just a really busy fall with a lot of great things, real joyful, wonderful fall. But I was, I was ready to slow down. I was ready to just, man, I need, some, I need some time off. I need to relax is what I need. And then December 1 hits. And with all that comes at Christmas time. But we've been talking about uh, the prayers of Christmas and trying to really broaden, expand our our, our prayer life, we talked about the prayers of expe expectation and how we can believe the Lord by faith. We really can trust him in our prayers. We talked about the prayers of listening last week with Joseph, who doesn't say a word in the entire Bible. He listens and he responds. And really, that's what prayer is. That's the Christian life, isn't it? And today we're going to talk about the prayer of celebration. And we're going to look at a passage that is well known and you've heard it before, and you're going to hear it again, praise God, today. So turn to Luke chapter 2. You're going to see verses 8 through 20, and we're going to look at the prayer of celebration. We're going to, let's talk about when and how to celebrate all that Christmas means. And this is not just a message for Christmas time. As you'll see, this is a message for all year long, every single day. And here, this passage will teach us that we celebrate in the routine. We celebrate in the remembering and we celebrate in the retelling. All right, so let's start with celebrating in the routine. Uh, we're gonna find the shepherds, here we go, who are out in the fields outside of Bethlehem and they're just doing the normal everyday routine of life. Verse eight, and in the same region, there were shepherds out in the field keeping watch over their flock by night. Now, this tells us that they're nearby. Okay, some of us have been to Bethlehem. And even still today, there are shepherds in the fields around Bethlehem. 
Uh, you may know that this was a lowly kind of everyday laborer uh, in society, the lowest of the low in many ways, uh, and they are just taking care of sheep. In fact, we see this uh, throughout the, the Old Testament. Um, the youngest one often, we see it with David, sometimes it's the youngest members of a family that are keeping the sheep. And history tells us too, often girls, women were shepherds. Don't want to blow your nativity scene too much, but there were girls, think about it, who would be given that task to take care of shepherds, uh, sheep. It doesn't take a lot to take care of sheep. You have to fend off maybe wild animals, maybe someone trying to rob your your flock, we see that, with, uh, Jesus speaks of it in John 10. But shepherding is happening today, literally, just outside of Bethlehem, which is in, by the, by the way, in the West Bank. Um, I don't know if you've seen on the news, this year, first time ever, Christmas at the Nat Church of Nativity has been canceled. You can't go there this year, which has a major impact on that, on, on, on the the, you know, the, the, the finances, the, the economy there. Um, but isn't that something that we can mess up as sinful people? We can even mess up Christmas celebrations. Now, Christmas is not canceled. But maybe this year for you, maybe you feel like your Christmas has been canceled in some way. Maybe you're going through the normal, maybe mundane stuff of life, and you have not just been real excited. I know it's the week of but I want to give you permission. If you find yourself in the routine of life, and it doesn't get more routine than this, you can meet God as well, just as the shepherds have. And we're going to talk about how this can happen, even this week, and yes, any day of the year in the normal stuff of life. Because isn't that what the Christian life really is? I mean, spectacular and wonderful in so many ways because we have the presence of the Spirit in us and the power of the Spirit in us. But most of life really takes place through the mundane, routine, through the regular. These shepherds are out in the field as they were the night before and the night before that and the night before that and for generations before them. And even still, it's happening in our day. And though God himself is compared to a good shepherd, we see it in uh, Psalm 23 and other places, in scripture and jesus who is the good shepherd it was actually an unclean profession you might know that there's a list of uh five five lists in fact put together by rabbis of the during this time of proscribed trades proscribed condemned forbidden trades even and shepherds are on the list because of the unclean work that they were doing these are not holy people they're not those that would be uh, you know, in the middle of what we might consider or they would have considered at the time God's family. And yet, yet they were. These are likely Jewish people and some have noted probably even taking care of the lambs that would be uh, offered as sacrifices at the temple there in that region. So a fascinating connection there. But most of us feel like the shepherds that there's no reason that God would Come and visit us, if we're honest. I mean, these shepherds didn't, they didn't spend 40 days in prayer and fasting and expecting God to move. They didn't prepare themselves at all. They were just doing life on the daily, and then God shows up in the routine. And I want you to, to know that we can be aware, watching for God to move. We know a lot more than they did, and we know that God's Spirit is with us. So, so most of us feel like God, maybe there's no reason that he would intervene in our lives. And yet, if we're watching, he does. We all have this kind of love-hate relationship, I think, with the routine and the mundane. Because on one hand, we can't function without routine. We all have patterns in our lives, right? Uh, some of you, even today, you said it, you'll say it this week, you can't get anything done because I haven't had my coffee yet today. We have routines, and some of them are helpful. Uh, in fact, studies show that uh, little children need bedtime routines. Even newborns need a bedtime routine, if it's possible, uh, months into their lives. But not only children, but adults need bedtime routines. Studies have shown that we get better sleep, we, we, we get better rest if we have a routine, regular rhythm in our lives. 
But on the other hand, we resent routines because we feel like the mundane can be boring and tiresome and, and everybody else is living their best life. We go to the same job, we have the same family, we have the same people in our lives, the same bed we sleep in, we go back to the same house or the same apartment and we crave excitement and spontaneity. And maybe this year, you're thinking Christmas feels a lot like just a normal another week, another day, except for the crowds of people, right? But I want to encourage you today that, that some of us spend our entire life trying to break up the monotony. And we, we pursue things that we should never pursue. We want the latest, greatest thing. And this is only amplified at Christmas time. And as the ads and commercials come at us, we think there's no place really where this intersection of, of routine and of this need for something more, no other place than Christmas. Because on the one hand, we want to experience Christmas as it always has been, right? Even today, we're singing songs that we always sing at Christmas time. And if we're not careful, we enter into the routine and we see a season rife with tradition. And if we're not careful, we could cast aside tradition, wanting the newest, latest, greatest thing. And on the other hand, we want new memories. We want a new person to show up. We want a new baby or a new grandbaby to show up. Or we want a new boyfriend or girlfriend. We want a new fiance to show up. So we're always in this tension of, on the one hand, the routine, and, and this tension between tradition and novelty and mundane and extraordinary routine, and the new thing is what we wrestle with all of our lives. And it's certainly true in the church, but it's true in our personal lives. Uh, you can imagine, as a pastor, I, I see our different personalities we can all lean one way or the other at different times. Some of us just want everything to stay just as it was, always. Don't change a thing, and others are, let's change everything. If, if, you know, let, let, let's, let's, let's break it up, and let's change everything. And so we live in this tension, but if we have too much routine, not enough spontaneity, we can take our traditions for granted. And the power that is found, we could disregard them. If we have too much spontaneity, not enough tradition, then everything seems a bit out of whack, a little chaotic. And I say all this because we need to ask, how can we celebrate in the midst of a tension that I don't think needs to be resolved, but the one that we live in? How can we celebrate in the middle of it all? Here's the question I have for you. What routines do you have in your life that constantly are putting you in position to hear from God? That's the question. What routines do you have in life? Not just, yeah, I, I have my coffee every morning. I get my, what am I, caffeine going every morning. Or here's what I do every day. I work out every Monday, Wednesday, or Friday. I go to work and I'm there at this time on this day and this day. What routines have you established in your life as a disciple of Jesus? We call them spiritual disciplines. People ask me, how can I hear from God? And you've heard me say it. There's a book for that. We read God's word every day. If we truly believe that he speaks to us through his word, wouldn't you be in it every single day? If you want God to speak to you, open his word. We have our dwell reading plan that we're all doing together. Why wouldn't you spend a moment in time out of many hours in a day Spend even 10 minutes reading God's word. And listen, if you want him to speak to you audibly, read the Bible out loud. Because he speaks to us through his word. Do you believe it? And if so, are you in his word? I could argue that you don't believe it if you're not in his word. So with all of the things that could take place on a daily basis, we read the Bible because the Bible, we read this recently, Isaiah 40, verse 8, the grass withers, the flowers fade, but the word of God endures forever. Life comes and goes, Christmas has come and go. The things that we might purchase next year, we won't even remember what we got for Christmas, likely 
But the word of God endures forever. That is applied to our lives, lived out. It changes everything. Even in the mundane, the routine of life, God shows up because we're in his word. We're listening for him. Friends, he will speak. This is how we break the monotony. And some of you know the broader context here is that these shepherds don't know. Uh, They're about to experience this, but God has not yet broken through. They don't know that he broke through with Zechariah and Elizabeth. 400 years of silence. But we must not confuse his silence with his presence because he's at work and he was always at work preparing his people for the perfect time. Paul says, just in the right moment of time, in the fullness of time, he comes as a baby born in Bethlehem. But this was anything but a joyful time for these shepherds. They're under a double oppression. You know that the Jewish people are living under this Roman dominance of power, a vassal state. And then life under Herod was not a real flourishing, happy life. And then these shepherds who find themselves at the lowest rung of society are there and God shows up to them. What does that tell us? Much has been written about the shepherds. And, and, and Luke's uh, introduction of the shepherds to us. Because this is no longer just a family affair. This is something for everyone. And it's something for people like the shepherds. And can we say it? Spiritually, regardless of where you think you are in the social strata, we're all just like the shepherds. Undeserving all sinners in need of grace, even feeling like we don't quite measure up. The celebration of of Christ's coming is not simply celebrated in the uh, obedience of spiritual disciplines every day. It goes much further than that. And here's what I want us to, to look at here. It's, yes, in the routine, but we also celebrate by remembering. This is why it's so important what we do Every year at this time of the year and every time we gather, we remember. We remember what Christ has done. So look at verse 9. And an angel of the Lord appeared to them. Suddenly these shepherds are spiritually accosted by an angel in the heavens. And the glory of the Lord shone around them and they were filled with great fear. They're terrified. And the angel said to them, fear not, for behold, this is a key word you can circle, look, don't be afraid, wait, why not, look, don't be afraid, focus on God, don't be afraid, focus on his word, not in the world, I bring you good news, the word is euangelion, It's, it's this good news, a proclamation of good news that has come, and it was a word, it was a phrase that was known in culture, a king would come. Or someone who come to announce the king is coming. Or to announce good news of great joy that will be for all the people. Not just for his people. Now this complete sensory overload comes at these shepherds and the powerful message comes. And what happens in this message, here's what I want us to do. Is to break this down. What are we remembering? Because in their message comes all the themes of Advent that we look at every single year. Let's look at them again. We need to remember the joy. We remember the joy. The angel comes, good news of great joy, the greatest news of all time. Not just for an historic moment in time, but for every single day of your life. Every day we can wake up with joy. We talk about this always at Christmas time. Joy is not happiness. That's happenstance. Happiness is based on circumstance what you have or don't have. Again, that's played out at Christmas time. What I want and what I don't have. Certainly kids and younger people, but sometimes even as adults, we need more and more to make us happy. And it never works. Because joy is something that goes beyond our circumstances. Because here's the thing that's true about us. Today and all year long coming up, you may have very unpleasant circumstances devastating circumstances and loss. But joy supersedes all of those things because joy is based on what has already happened. 
We talk about what would Jesus do? The better question that precedes that question is what has Jesus done? He's come. And he lived the perfect life for you. He died on the cross for your sin. You can have eternal life, and many of us do, having received by faith what he's done for us. And so we have joy every day, not based on our circumstances. We've said it often. It doesn't matter what you're going through. Not really, not in terms of your joy. Because you see, we can, we can, we can look at these shepherds and see they, they're, they have reason to be less happy than any of us here today. And yet, God says, there's joy that's come to you. It's intriguing, isn't it, that God would choose shepherds because our joy is not found in what we own. It's not found in what we know, not our education, not in our jobs, our position. It's not even found in our comfort because surely they didn't feel a lot of that. It's found in Christ and in him alone. So regardless of where you are today, regardless of what you're going through today, be encouraged by the Spirit of God. Your Savior is immovable, and his love does not change. You have reason for great joy in your life. Look at this. Remember the hope. Look at verse 11. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, the Rescuer, who is Christ, that's the word, Messiah, and the Lord of all. He is the one the angel tells the shepherd, shepherds has come and they have the long-awaited Messiah has come. Think about this. You can't celebrate without hope, right? If you have nothing to look forward to, there's no reason for hope, which is why many of us struggle. One of the things that keeps us from hoping, even at Christmas time, is that we place our trust in things that will not come through for us. And again, it's amplified, I think, at Christmas time. We place our hopes in the wrong things. Even as we're young and children do this, if I could just get that, I'll be happy. I hope to get that gift and I'll be happy. But we place our hopes in our, again, positions and how about this, in people who let us down. Either they're taken away from us or maybe by our own doing. They leave our lives, they come in and out of our lives and we've placed our trust in them and they let us down. Our trust is not found in positions or people, the idols that we make, but only in Christ because he alone will not let you down. He's the only one you can worship who will not let you down. So today is a good day to pause as we approach the week of Christmas and ask yourself, where do you place your trust? Where have you been let down? And could it be that you've placed your trust in things that are fading away? I've referenced C.S. Lewis often when he said, you should never place your worth or your value, your happiness, on something you may lose. And yet we do it all the time. And I think part of being a Christian, I've seen this in my life, the process of sanctification is God, by his grace, Stripping away one idol after another. And that sounds doable, I suppose, from the pulpit here. It is terrifying. And it is crushing for our good. Because all of the idols that we put in our lives will let us down. We need to remember the joy. We need to remember the hope. We need to remember the love. Look at this. And this will be the sign. Notice it's a sign. We're going to talk about this next week. At Christmas Eve, you will find a baby wrapped in swaddling cloths and lying in a manger. Wrapped up in all of this, if Jesus is anything, he is God's love wrapped up in a baby. In the flesh, the incarnation means that God in all of his great love for us has wrapped himself up in a baby and he comes to us. The sign is a baby Watch this, in a manger, something these shepherds are very familiar with. They're around mangers all the time. God comes right where they are. He brings his love to them right where they are. Consider this, how he doesn't come. He didn't come as a king 
Because these shepherds, the lowest of the social strata, are not going to rush into the palace to find the king. He didn't come as a great warrior. These shepherds are not going to rush through a company of soldiers to get to the great warrior. He comes as a baby. Because if he had not, they would not have come to find him. He's in a manger. He meets them right where they are, and he's doing that in your life right now. That's the story of the shepherds, that he's come to you into your life. And and he's saying, come to me as I have come to you. He comes right to where we are, the incarnation, the in flesh. God comes to us exactly where we are, and he meets you right where you are today. So we don't need to gain his approval. We don't have to work our way to get to him. He comes to us, and this is what brings peace. Only he could bring peace to us. While we were yet sinners, Christ comes and he dies for us. He brings peace because the peace we need is peace between us and God first. Peace with ourselves. Gospel peace and rest with our own souls so that we can have peace with others. Which comes by extending grace and loving others just as they are. And it's such a freeing way to live. So we remember the peace Look at this. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host praising God and saying, glory to God in the highest and on earth peace among those with whom he is pleased. Look at this. The single angel is now joined by, you could say, an army of angels. But this army comes not announcing war. They come announcing peace. And this peace is going to come to us not by way of tanks or swords or missiles or or guns. This good news is coming from a king who comes in the form of a baby. The king has come, and yes, don't miss this, he's come to conquer his enemies because that's what brings glory to kings. They eliminate the enemy. They, they bring peace to the people because how does a king gain glory? By eliminating his enemies. But watch this. This king does it in a spectacular way. He makes his enemies his friends by coming and dominating our hearts with his love by faith, not through anything that we have to do. He doesn't come to conquer us or destroy us. He doesn't come to eliminate us. He comes to invite us into friendship with him, into fellowship with him. And we can receive it and have peace forever. This is the good news. And yet, like these shepherds, some of us don't feel like we deserve it. I talk to so many people who get right to the edge of faith and say, yeah, but I don't deserve this. Here's here's the truth you need to hear. You don't deserve it. It is grace that's coming to you. In fact, some of you read this like I have through the years. This peace comes, did you catch this? To those with whom he is pleased. And I'm certain that you, like me perhaps, some of us here today, you read that and you go, I know he's not pleased with me. He can't be pleased with me. And again, I could say it this way. He's not Oh, he loves you. He, he's love. But he comes to us just where we are and as we are, but he doesn't want us to stay there. He comes to rescue us from ourselves, from our sin. He's not pleased with where we are. That's why he's come. This is the bad news in the midst of the good news that has come. Good news come because there's bad news. Because we are destined to eternity apart from him in our sin, and he comes to rescue us. Friends, listen, you don't have to do anything to get to him. He comes to you because if you could gain your salvation, then you could lose your salvation. And watch this. If we could lose our salvation, we would. Every single one of us. So he comes to capture our hearts So we remember the joy, we remember the hope, we remember the love, remember the peace. 
And we do this, watch this, by celebrating further by retelling the story, okay? We celebrate by retelling the story. Many of us don't celebrate because we're too silent. We need to proclaim it out loud like the shepherds do here. This story never gets old. In fact, look at verse 15. When the angels went away from them into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, let us go over to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has made known to us. And they went with haste. They went quickly and found Mary and Joseph and the baby lying in a manger. And when they saw it, they made known the saying that had been told them concerning the child. And all who heard it wondered at what the shepherds told them. But Mary always loved this, verse 19. As only a mother could do, she treasured up all these things, pondering them in her heart. And the shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all they had heard and seen as it had been told them. The story ends with the shepherds doing exactly what they were told to do. This is prayer. Hearing from God and then doing what he says. Notice all the verbs in that passage. Did you catch that? They, 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 go, they, they, they saw it. They heard it. They made it known. They wondered. Mary wondered at it. She treasured it. They returned. They glorified God. They praised God. They told the story over and over again. And don't you know they did it throughout their lives? They're talking about it. They're revealing it. They're describing it. And friends, listen, we've been called to do the same. We have been called to be messengers to the world. Because here, here's what's true about this tension between mundane, been there, done that, and the new exciting thing. We tell the same story every single year. And we need to hear it again and again and again and again. Because the retelling of the story ignites our faith all over again. If you yawn through Luke 2, you're going to yawn your way through life. And you're going to miss what he has done for you and what he's called you to join him in. And that is to be a messenger. Some of you know that the word uh, angel is actually the word messenger. So these shepherds, you could say, went from being Shepherds of sheep to shepherding the great news, the very first ones to proclaim the good news of Jesus. They become, can I say it? Angels. Royal messengers of the greatest news on the planet. God is raising each of us up. Here's what I'm going to do today I'm going to give you a new job description, I'm going to give you a new position. You've just been, you have just been given a new job, a promotion. You're an angel. That's who you are. You're an angel. Bringing good news to other people in your life. You can become an angel to someone this week and in your life as you tell them about your love for Jesus because of his great love for you. Charles Spurgeon is the one who said, Every Christian is either a missionary or an imposter because we have been given this news to share with others. I have a confession as I was preparing our Christmas Eve service, a message, sermon. I gathered with a group of, of others, collaborative thinking along the way. I said, let's talk about Christmas Eve. Here's an idea I have. And I went into this idea about um, heroes and villains and, and how Christ has come as the hero, how heroes and villains have the same backstory. Uh, it's only how they've, they've managed pain, what they've done with pain. And I had this whole thing played out and it's real creative. And the team, I could tell, was kind of, mm, 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 I don't know. Which is the beauty of, of working together. And left the meeting after the fact, thought through it a lot, and I was like, and here's what came to us all. And this is, again, mass confession. I'm, I'm telling you what you're going to hear next week, too, by the way. We, we decided, I decided, 
Let's just tell the story again. Let's not get lost in some new thing, the creative thing. Let's not run with two stories. Let's tell one story, the greatest story, the story everybody needs to hear again. We're going to gather and talk about what Jesus has done. We're going to look at Luke 2 again because we need to retell the story because I think many of us have lost the fact that this really is good news. And it's the gospel that changes lives, not our creativity, not the newest, latest, greatest thing. Many Christians, I see this in our culture today. It seems that many Christians have come to believe that we can't win the public persuasively by our love and by the power of the gospel. Instead, many think we've got to do it politically or through some worldly power we need to somehow legislate legislate christian domination over culture which always backfires by the way we need to get back to the lost art of evangelism on a relational level that's how we're going to reach the culture that's how the kingdom comes that what brings systemic change to the world if we believe it Not by power, not by might, but by his spirit, says the Lord. And it comes as we go and tell the good news to people all around us. So, I've got two challenges for you. Here's how we're going to land across our campus today and all of our services. So the word became flesh and dwelt among us. He came, as John said, to the world that he had made. So that the world through him might be remade. And he does it through us, through the angels that are in this room that go forth with the message of the gospel. And this week, here's the challenge. Could it be when you gather, maybe it's with family who are coming into town, maybe you're going somewhere, maybe you'll find yourself alone. I don't know what Christmas might look like for you. Two challenges. One, what if you were the one who said, um, Can we all gather just, could I just read Luke 2 to everybody, get back to really what this is all about? Would you be so bold to do that? And then here's the second challenge. Is to proclaim the fact that we're going to gather next Sunday. And we'll do it this Sunday after that as well which is New Year's Eve, by the way. Come join us. I'm excited about that day as well. But next week, we're going to gather and celebrate the fact that Christ has come, and we're going to share the gospel with everyone who shows up. Could it be that you will be the one, the herald, who will invite them to come and join you? Think about who God has placed on your heart and just say to them, a coworker, a friend, a neighbor, hey, I'm curious. Here's what I always say. I'm curious. Do you have a church or a place you might go worship on Christmas Eve this year? They can say yes, and you can celebrate with them. Tell me more about that. They can say no, and you can say, I'd love for you to come join me. Because the music's going to be great. We're going to have carols. We're going to have candles. We're going to have kids. And we're going to have a blast. Would you come join us? I'll be at this service. I'll meet you. Friends, every one of us can do that. Could it be that this week, of all weeks, that this is the week where we can say, yes, Lord, I'll be an angel to someone in my life. Let's commit to that. And let's pray together. Lord, we thank you for your word. We thank you that you have come to us. We thank you that we can celebrate Christmas this year. We can celebrate in the routine We can celebrate regardless of what's going on in our lives. And we can celebrate by remembering. And we can celebrate by retelling the story over and over again. So, Lord, I pray that you'll bless every person here. And for those of you who have not yet received his grace, friend, you can do it right now. Just say, yes, Lord. Come into my life as you have come into that manger Come into my life and take over my life. Thank you for dying on the cross for me. 
I give you my life as an act of worship and make me all that you've created me to be. Lord, we love you and we praise you for speaking to us today. And now we go to respond in Jesus' name. Amen.